Hi, everyone. Today we are doing a very special episode with a very special guest. I'm very excited because today we're going to be talking with Mark Miller, who is a very prolific comic creator. You may know him from his work at Marvel. There's all of the Ultimate Universe, Ultimate. You may know him from his own work from Miller World. You have Kick-Ass, you have Wanted, Nemesis. You have so many things and they are still ongoing and I'm excited to talk to him about a lot of them. So... Thank you so much for coming and taking the time to chat with me about, well, everything. My total pleasure. I mean, off camera, you and I have started talking already because we share all the same obsessions with like 80s DC comics and so on. So I love I love this channel. Like this is one of those like cartoonist kayfabe and everything. There's, there's a few channels that all the pros all check out and yours is one of them. I, I love it. Well, thank you. I really appreciate the kind words. It's funny because one of the things I do is I actually perform this level of cognitive dissonance where I'm like, nobody's watching. And it helps me just be able to talk about whatever. So what are some of your favorite 80s DC books? Oh, my God. Where do you start? It's um, <laughs> like we said before, like um, there's a thing called Cover Browser online. Mm -hmm. And um, it's so addictive. I mean, what you do is you basically type in a year or a month or whatever, and you see all the books that Marvel or DC brought out that month or all the indie books that were out that month. And it goes back to like 1935 or something. And I waste quite a lot of time on it. You know, I'm always, like, I'm always curious what came out in like, you know, March 1957 or something like this, you know. Um, but what I have noticed when I look at it is just how many things I was reading in the 1980s. And I don't even think it's nostalgia because... A lot of that stuff I I wasn't aware of. The Marvel comics weren't distributed in Scotland where I grew up, so it's not as if I'm like, oh, yeah, this reminds me of being 13 or whatever. It's just such good stuff. There was just such an amazing number of creatives um, who were at the top of their game, who were working in the industry from 1981 to 1988, 89 or something. It was just an incredible period, running from Camelot 3000 and all those things that were the beginning of the new DC in 1981 ish, when guys like Brian Bolands were the first wave of um, UK creators really coming into mainstream comics in America, up to the emergence of the guys who followed Alan Moore, you know, the sort of Neil Gaiman's, Grant Morrison's, and uh, Pete Milligan's, and so on, you know, who came in towards the end of the decade. Such an amazing time. I mean, I, I was just reading everything I could afford, and, and what I couldn't afford, I would read in the store. I just, I find it so fascinating to be in an era where there's so much accessibility for it, which is great yeah. because you get the chance to go and peruse all of these histories. <coughs> and I love that everything's coming out in giant tomes that can then be oh. collected. I'm like, please don't stop. All of them, everything inside of a tome. <laughs> <laughs> and it's funny because I see so many people online saying, oh, I wish it was like the old days. I wish it was spinner racks, you know, before there was comic stores and there was comics available on newsstands. The thing I always say to everybody is we've never had it as good as we have it right now. I mean, as a guy who grew up in that time, like, I really appreciate what we have now. Like, most people have a comic shop kind of nearby, you know, that's accessible because most major cities have got a comic store. And even if you live in the countryside, if you live in a rural area, you've got either digital comics you can lay your hands on, Russian pirate sites, or you've got, <laughs> or you've got um, Amazon, which can deliver your graphic novels next day for you, you know? And plus, the idea of like a graphic novel collecting something that came out 40 years ago, you could never possibly afford it. When I was a kid, I was too young to have read the Neil Adams Green Arrow, Green Lantern mm -hmm. stories, and everything, you know, and I could never afford them because they were so far out of my price range, even when I was a teenager, you know. And now you just hit a button and it's all there for you next day at a reasonable price. You know, you can pick this stuff up. So, I mean, we're so spoiled. It's absolutely amazing. I love that this stuff's at our fingertips like this. And if we ever went back to the, the newsstands, what I say to everyone is I said, the newsstands worked okay when there was like 20 DC books and 15 Marvel books. And one, you know, one copy of each or maybe two was available on your newsstand. Imagine now when there's seven or 800 comics every month and all those indie books and all the multiple Batman titles and everything, your corner store would just can them all. They would only order the top 10 books, you know? So, so I think what we've got right now we should appreciate is pretty damn good. I think it's really interesting to be able to be in this time of change because things are yeah. changing. They're always changing, always moving. And I'm personally very interested to see the direction which things evolve into because I'm really excited about comics and all of the plethora of comics that are out there because at this time in particular, it feels like there is just so much and so much choice and so many different avenues to get to them. At times, I wonder if that's part of what's so overwhelming 
for people because without that kind of central hub or source, it can be a bit difficult to figure out what's even going on or being published. A lot of times when I talk about stuff, people are like, I didn't even know that was happening. But then once they know, they're really excited to be able to go and check it out. Well, that's a really interesting point because <clears throat> when I brought out um, Kingsman, it was originally called The Secret Service. And that was um, 2010, 11 or thereabouts, you know, maybe 2012 even. Um, but I remember being nervous to launch something that wasn't a superhero title. Mm. And that, that sounds crazy now, doesn't it? But superheroes had such a stranglehold on the market for over half a century that the idea of bringing something out that wasn't a superhero book, that was a spy book, that was an amazing risk to the point where I didn't let anybody know in the promotional material that it was a, a spy book because mm. I thought only people would, only superhero stuff had a chance in the market. And that's nuts when you think about it because I would say now in the last 10 years in particular, we're able to do any genre, like anything. You can do a comic book about anything now. Whereas if you were somebody like John Byrne or Marv Wolfman or whatever, you know, you're working in 1970s, 1980s comics. If you don't do something that's a pre-existing title, it's never going to find an audience. You know, it's, it has to be something that's owned by Marvel or DC. If you're lucky, you come in and you do a two or three or four year run on one of these things. And that's it. And you can only <clears throat> you can only do superheroes and you can only pretty much do superheroes that already exist. You know, since about 1943, you can count on two hands the number of DC characters that have caught on. You know, like they're usually updates of something that was created between 1938 and 1943. You know, so it was very, very hard to come up with something new. Um, and my whole business is based on doing new stuff. I mean, I'd have found it impossible if I'd been born a, a generation earlier. So what is your favorite genre to work in since you have the option to play around so much? Do you have a favorite? I think historically it would be superheroes for sure. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. I, I mean, I was, I, I was just, I was a kid at the time when all the most exciting superhero books were being made, you know, from Alan Moore, Frank Miller, Marv Wolfman, you know, this is John Byrne. This is all people at the top of their game, you know, in, the, in my childhood. So it was an amazing alignment of the stars. But I think now what interests me more as a writer actually is doing other stuff and I've really enjoyed doing like the Magic Order for example like doing a horror book, doing a dark fantasy book there'd have been no market for that when I was growing up you know like Sandman was revolutionary you know sort of touching on that stuff in the late 80s but there was nothing like that you know the early 1970s there was a renaissance of horror comics particularly mm -hmm. these Marvel had the Dracula book, the werewolf book and so on as well Ghost Rider stuff like that um, but but really, um, I, th I think horror is probably what interests me most just now. I really, I've really enjoyed doing horror stuff, and it feels so different from superhero stuff that I feel I'm flexing different muscles when I'm writing that kind of thing. Like I would say, I've done I've done this job since I was 19, and I feel Magic Horror is my best ever work. I've I tapped into something there that I didn't mm -hmm. know I had. Inside me, you know? Horror is really fascinating because I feel like horror in a way has almost an uphill battle sometimes because you do have it being compared inevitably to a lot of on-screen adaptations and the like and just the way that yeah. those can deliver a scare is very different than how you have to write it and pace it and panel it out and you yeah. work in a space where sometimes some of your stuff does end up being adapted does that impact how you write it like do you think about that while you're writing it I never think about an adaptation because um like I think it's hard it's so hard to write one story without thinking about it in multiple forms you know so one of the nice things about working in comics is not thinking about budget and all these things that you do think about whenever you're writing a screenplay um so I, I love the freedom of comics the fact that you can t tell a story about anything but I know what you mean because horror for example in movies relies so much on sound and mm -hmm. atmosphere and all these things that you can't quite get in a comic in the same way you know a sound effect doesn't give you the same scare as a jump scare does you know in a movie um, but there's other ways to get under people's skin. Like Alan Moore um, has run on Swamp Thing. If I had to pick a favorite run from the 80s, like you asked earlier, I would say it's possibly Alan Moore's Swamp Thing, which has been weirdly memory hold now, you know, because he did so many other things like Watchmen mm -hmm. and Beef and and so on. But, but that run on Swamp Thing was so revolutionary and it really got under my skin in terms of horror. Like I can remember lines of dialogue, I can remember descriptive lines in the captions. I can remember mm -hmm. the exact panel layouts of the drawings. It was a really, really creepy comic. And I was 13, 14 when I was reading that stuff. So just at the perfect age to have the mm -hmm. health care I think it's because you can play a lot with the imagery in different mm -hmm. ways. You get to dial up some. There are just some things you can do in illustration that you can't do in other forms. It's really freeing. There are just some things that 
you have the space to do in comics that you don't in other mediums. And I think that's part of what makes them so exciting is that you really can stretch the imagination in that way. And it makes it a lot of fun, whether it's an, an individual issue or a giant shared epic. So mm. I really enjoy that part of it. Like, what is your favorite part of crafting comics? Um, I think I like to try and do, I, I like the idea of creating something that never existed before and putting that in the world. Like, there's something really nice. I mean, I, I just came back from Corfu. I was in Corfu last week with the family and on the plane home, which doesn't happen very often, but I saw somebody reading one of my books mm -hmm. and I kind of, it's a real thrill whenever you see that, you know, because most people in public aren't reading a comic book, you know, you rarely see it. So whenever you do, you really remember it, you know, and I saw somebody reading one of my books on the plane and I was like, you know, there's that little part that you want to go up and say, tis I, you know, and go up and say, <laughs> <laughs> but you could have a quiet satisfaction. But what I did find myself doing was I was actually watching them and thinking, I hope they read this all the way through. They don't get bored and stop halfway and everything. <laughs> I, was, I was checking that kind of thing. Out. But there's something lovely about some, some people occupying their time with your thoughts, like something that, that didn't exist that you've put in their head and that they get entertained by. There's, um, there's a showmanship side of it that's really nice like that. And also, I mean, I've got a lot of friends who are stand-up comedians, and they say that what drives them every night is the search for the perfect audience, the perfect gig, the perfect joke. And it's a bit like that too, because like any craft, you try and make it as good as it can possibly be. And you never quite get it as good as it is in your head, but the quest is to try and get it as good as that original idea was for you. And there's a real joy in making these things, you know, and if you can get it as close to that as possible, it's a very satisfying feeling. Do you find that when it comes to characters that you return to, do you find that you get closer and closer each time to the idea in your head or does it just vary from comic to comic? Um, I think, um, I don't think, it's an, that's a really interesting question because I don't think, strangely, you, you, you get closer each time you do it with a particular character. I think it's either there or it's not. And in the occasions where something hasn't worked out as well as I've wanted, you almost know in page two, it's not mm -hmm. gonna, you know, you, you can just feel it is not quite connecting the way it's supposed to. And I'm, I'm lucky that I've, I don't really feel that very often, but whenever it does, it's something that's quite immediate. It's like Stephen King's got the best description of writing a story where he said, it's like the story already exists and you're just trying to mm -hmm. bring it into the world. And he described it as being like an archeologist who's dusting down something that's under the sand and you're trying not to break it as you bring it to the surface. And that's what a story feels like. And you know right away if you're if you're doing it correctly. You know, so so I, I never find book three easier than book one. You know, mm -hmm. it's it just that it, it's something that either connects with you or it doesn't. Like kick ass immediately from page one. I knew exactly what I was doing. It just it felt I knew this world. It was fully formed in my head as soon as I started writing it. Um, mm -hmm. and that's a nice feeling when that happens. So now that you have all of these worlds together and they're kind of interconnected, was that something you saw from very early on with Miller World? Yeah, kind of. I like the idea of, um, I didn't want to do a formal universe because I thought it's, it can get a little bit convoluted. Like I feel very uneasy when I see my friends who work in film saying, oh yeah, this is how this all connects and I'm building this universe here and everything. And I was like, ah, oh, you know, universes to me is something that's in cinematic terms. It's something unique to Marvel and actually just unique to Marvel between 2008 and 2019. I think that's the only time in history it's ever worked, a universe. Like people mm. bought into this idea that these movies were connected in a way that they wouldn't have bought into the Godfather and Jaws and Star Wars being connected, you know? Like they accepted that these things all took place and usually in New York, you know, all in one, <laughs> one place. And and I, I think it's really... I think it's really reductive, actually, to pull your things together to ostensibly, you know, I think, like, uh, I've always slightly avoided it because what seems like a huge strength, like making these things all connect, actually becomes the downfall if they all start to not work. Mm -hmm. So, for example, Universal Pictures have got Despicable Me and they've got The Fast and the Furious, Jurassic Park, and a whole bunch of other franchises. But if any one of those things fails it doesn't pull down the other franchises. They're all quite distinct from one another. Whereas I think the Marvel stuff not working over the last few years has really hurt the Marvel brand in general because their strength was they were interconnected, but that's now become their weakness because you feel, okay, I've missed the last 15 Marvel TV shows. 
So will I bother going to see the new Marvel movie? You know. So I've, I've, I have tried to avoid that, but what I've done is I've thrown in little Easter eggs for people who kind of maybe like the idea of it being connected. So you have little things in the background going on, much like Sam Raimi did in the Spider-Man movies, where he would make references to Doctor Strange or whatever this kind of thing. You know, I like the idea of just little nods in there, and then for fun, I put them all together in one story in Big Game uh, mm -hmm. and did a big crossover, but. It's not that important. You can read the books individually on their own, I think. And I like movies mm -hmm. to be like that. Do you have a favorite? Like, I know you said you feel like really solid and good about Magic Order, but do you have a favorite character that's emerged from this universe? Um, I think Ma Magic Order, I think, is is probably my favorite. You know, they're, they're, mm -hmm. they're nearly all behind me here. I, I really mm -hmm. enjoyed Duke I love Kick-Ass. King of Spies, I, I, I really love as well. Like, King of Spies is my old man James Bond project. Mm -hmm. You know, like... If James Bond was 68 years old and found out he had six months to live and he decides to just kill all the people he ever wanted to kill before he dies, you know? Like, there's a real simplicity in that, just four issues. I was really happy with it. Um, this makes me sound like a, hu a huge fan of my own stuff, you know, but, like, I do I do really enjoy them, you know? So <laughs> <laughs> I think it's important to enjoy what you work on. Do you still have the spare time to check out other comics? And, like, is it still something that you seek out? Yeah, absolutely. You know, like um, I, I, I have drifted a little bit. I've got to say, like I, I was into manga for a little while. I sort of drifted mm -hmm. away from American comics a little bit around about 2015, and I went a bit more manga for a while. But I've actually decided to go a bit more European now. Like um, mm -hmm. I was in Copenhagen. My wife and I were in holiday in Copenhagen a few weeks ago, and when we were over there, I found this comic store that just reminded me how much I love European albums. Mm -hmm. And there is something just so beautiful about them. They're so well put together. Like over here, this side of my office is a lot of my uh, mm -hmm. European collections of my own stuff, you know. And like mm -hmm. the Panini packages them just so well. The, the hard covers are great. The spines look beautiful and everything, you know. And I, I, I love the elegance of them. They look great. So I've got a little bit more into uh, European stuff. But there's still things I'm checking out in the, U the US scene as well. I love Jeremy Adams. He did a great job in The Flash doing a terrific mm -hmm. job of Lantern at the moment. I follow Scott Snyder, you know, so that Josh Williamson's great. I love what Kirkman's been doing with the Skybound books, you know, all this G.I. Mm -hmm. Joe stuff. I'm, I'm about three years too old for G.I. Joe. I kind of missed it as a child, you know, um, but I really appreciate what those guys have done. I think they've, they've created genuine excitement at a time when mm -hmm. there isn't a lot of excitement in, in comics, which is good. No, I've really enjoyed seeing that. I also missed the G.I. Joe bracket, but I just like seeing people so excited. That's one of my favorite things about comic fandom, because lots of times people talk about it as a very solitary hobby, which it can be. But yeah. I feel like online has allowed there to be a bit more of a shared space, and, and that can be oh. a positive and a negative. But I yeah. think that on the whole, especially when the excitement is high, it's a really positive experience. Oh my God, completely. Like, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, yeah, there's a few nutcases, but I mean, it's just the democratization of the internet. You know, it's like you have to accept the rough with the smooth, you know? Uh, but the vast majority of people that you'll come across are fantastic, you know? And it's like at mm -hmm. comic conventions. I've been going to comic conventions since I was 13 years old, maybe. And it's always amazing. I always have a great time. And I, I remember the first one I walked into, I remember uh, when I was 13, going into this place and I by, by the time I was 13 I was maybe the last of my friends reading comics right so most of my friends checked out when they were about 11 everybody read them from about five until they were 11 and then I had a couple of years of being the only guy reading them so I kept it kind of quiet I was still reading comics you know and I went to a comic convention and I remember walking in and seeing hundreds of people who were just like me mm -hmm. and it was amazing and you could strike up conversations with complete strangers I went in on my own and you could strike strike up conversations with strangers, and they were into all the things you were into, knew exactly what you were talking about, were carrying the same books you had under your arm and everything, and it was a magical experience. And the internet is that on a global scale. It's fantastic. I love it. No, it's really exciting, especially because you can connect with people from all over the world. And it's really interesting because I feel like the immediacy of it also does alter just some of the ways that comics are thought of in a way because you get that 
feedback instantly. And I yeah. don't know, I feel like that does something. There's not that break or that gap. Like when I go through and I read letters columns, which is one of my favorite things to read in old yeah. issues. And whenever they do facsimiles, I feel that they should be there. But I just, I wonder if that, if that immediacy makes a difference. Like, are you someone who seeks out feedback on your work or is it something that just oh, comes yeah. to you? Or yeah. Oh, everyone does. I mean, anyone who says they don't is lying, you know? And <laughs> absolutely. I mean, some of my friends are like really famous actors, right? And every day they Google themselves and see what people are saying, you know? Because of course you do. Like, why, why wouldn't you? Really? <laughs> and it's, it's, if you if you could eavesdrop on somebody in a bar and they were talking about you, you'd be, like, you'd be leaning in. To hear <laughs> and that's essentially the internet, you know? So you, you can't help it, of course. But, you know, it's, it's really fun, you know, like, and, and if you, there's nothing more honest than people you don't know. So like whenever somebody's critiquing your stuff, they can be correct. Even, even if you think mm -hmm. it's worked out well, somebody can spot something you didn't spot or notice something that didn't quite work. And I think it's very valuable. It's useful. You can't become too hung up on it. You can't obsess over it or anything, but I think it's very valuable. You have to be quite humble when you're doing any kind of entertainment because the audience is a hundred percent correct. You know, you're not doing this for you. You're doing this to please an audience. You know? So you, mm -hmm. you have to listen. And if you don't listen to them, it's the ultimate arrogance, isn't it? Do, how do you find that you're able to keep that balance of humility? Because it, it can be hard when there's so many, like, comments and everything coming at you, like, you know, 100 miles a minute. <laughs> well, generally, you know, people are very nice. I mean, I, I'm lucky. Generally, my stuff goes down well. Going back, you know, pro ever since I turned about maybe... 28 or something, I felt I sort of got a bit of a grip on it when I was doing Superman Adventures. That was the first time I felt, you know, like my skill set was kind of coming together after a few years. It took a long time. But when I was doing the Superman Adventures book back in the late 90s, I just thought, I think I know how to do this now. You know, it was, mm -hmm. it was coming together. Since then, generally, people are nice. You know, that I'm lucky that a lot of the stuff I do is very big, very high-profile stuff. And, the, you know, that will encourage in a certain number of crazies and everything but but sometimes even the crazies are right you know so like so you, you have to listen you know you, ha you have to al always treat every job like it's your first in terms of enthusiasm and like it's your last in terms of humility you know to think mm -hmm. somebody's had to pay for this you know so do do your best possible job and comics aren't cheap now so they have to be especially good i think have you found that anything's changed profoundly with your style over the years in terms of how you write uh, yeah, I, I, I tend to kind of try and flex different muscles. Yeah, very much, actually. Yeah, so so I remember when I started out, I did horror stuff. And mm -hmm. somebody said, oh, he's the horror guy. So I, then I thought, well, I'll do something that's a little bit lighter. You know, so I did Swamp Thing, and then I did Superman Adventures, which couldn't be more different. And then I remember somebody suggesting me for a job on something, and they said, no, no, he's the guy who does the kids stuff. So then I made sure the next thing I did was really hardcore, which was the authority, you know. And mm -hmm. and I... I and mix it up so when people would say I, a lot of the stuff I did in the noughties um, you know from the authority ultimate civil war old man Logan that sort of period was quite um, visceral and you know quite dark and everything because that's what audiences were responding most to and it's what I wanted to read and what I wanted to write at the time too but then when somebody said oh he's the guy who does the cynical stuff I'm like okay then I immediately followed that with really upbeat light stuff and everything as well. So I, I like to try and confound the audience when they think you're one thing to try and sort of do something else. It's great creatively, but it's also great from a business point of view too, because it means you don't kind of get stuck in a rut. You know, you're not, people don't feel they've read everything you've done. Like every one of these books behind me really feels quite different. Like Starlight could almost be a Pixar movie, you know, but it's on, it's on the same shelves as something like Wanted, which is super dark. You know? I find that really fascinating about your work. Like I like hopping around. Like I remember when I think the first one I read was Nemesis and I hop from that to Superior and those are quite different from each other. Yes. And so I've also been quite fascinated with seeing the return of Nemesis. So there was quite, cause that one I think has the biggest gap in between its yeah. original run and then its return. Did you find that it was difficult to get back into the headspace for Nemesis? No, it was actually, um, it was really easy because, um, Whenever I did the original Nemesis run, I had a very finite amount of time. And I remember I was writing it around about the time the Kick-Ass movie was coming out. And I was doing press junkets and traveling and all this kind of stuff. And I just didn't quite have the time. And Steve McNevin, the genius who was drawing it, 
He only had very specifically four issues, four regular sized issues in terms of space. And I never, it did really well. Like that book did really, really well. We did great on the trades and everything too. But for me personally, I felt I never did the best version of it. Steve did an amazing job in the artwork, but I felt the story was a little bit rushed and the ending was a bit convoluted. It just, it didn't really work for me. It was one of the few times mm -hmm. where I just felt there's a better version of this. And it always slightly rankled me, you know, it was always sitting there, but people liked it, you know, and every, every time I would do a show or a signing or whatever, 10 people would bring copies of it along to be signed. It was, even though it was only a four issue series, there was something about that character that, and the visual that people really liked. So um, I always had this fantasy of doing a reboot of it, which people do sometimes, you know? So Marvel uh, less so, but DC used to reboot their characters, broadly speaking, every 10, 15, 20 years. So Superman, for example, in 1970 is very different from the Superman in the 60s. Yeah. <laughs> and very different from the Superman in the 40s, you know? So. And in the 80s, Superman's different again. So I thought, do I have the balls to do this, you know, to actually go and reboot my own character? And just, <laughs> so I went off and I just thought of a better way of doing Nemesis. And it actually tied in so nicely with Wanted, this idea that I had tied in so nicely with Wanted and led into the big game crossover and would be so unexpected, the idea of pulling all these stories together. Um, I couldn't wait. And for me, I, I had a much better structure for it, which was the revenge storyline was much more powerful than just the the idea of like Batman as a terrorist. You know, the revenge aspect of it was much more interesting. It gave it an extra layer to the story, the the Counts of Monte Cristo of it all. Um, so I uh, I just I got the best Batman artist who was working in comics. Um, you know, I absolutely love Jorge Jimenez and stuff. Mm -hmm. He agreed to come and do it with me, and and we had an absolute ball. And my plan is to make this a trilogy. The The old one kind of exists in some pre-crisis continuity, whatever, you know. Mm -hmm. it, it's not part of the whole thing there. But there's the Jorge Jimenez run, then the one that comes out next week uh, on the 24th, uh, Valerio Gian Giordano's version. I love, I mean, it couldn't have worked out better. And then there's a final part of the trilogy that will come out, I think, round about next summer. It'll start about next summer. Um, and that's it. That'll be the Nemesis story told. And we're, we're planning to do them as three movies at Netflix as well. So how far out are you usually planned with your work, with your books? Like, do you normally have them planned a few years in advance or does it vary? Yeah, yeah. Usually, usually um, I, I tend to think about stuff about 18 months ahead. And then I, I start plotting them. I sp I'll spend maybe two weeks plotting something with little cards and a, a very detailed scene by scene breakdown of the whole run you know, um, on little cards for a couple of weeks. And then I usually write about 12, 14 months out from publication, just so the artist has a nice big chunk of time. And if I can, I try and not publish until the artist has finished the final issue. Um, so there's no problems because I remember 10, 15 years ago, it used to be a nightmare. Like the artists were always late. I'd always have one or two issues out and then big delays. Whereas every book we've done for the last 10 plus years has been on time, which is an amazing feeling. Yeah. So now that you have your own universe that's running, do you find that you're still imp like impacted by trends that are happening from the big two, or is that now more of a separate thing? Yeah, I, I don't even think about it, you know? So like, I, I just exist in my own little thing, you know? So, I mean, like I say, I, I, I read some stuff, you know, I usually mm -hmm. follow writers, but um, I don't think, okay, what's the big you cross over this summer, what's my version of it? Mm -hmm. you know, I, 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 I try and just set my own trends, you know? Mm -hmm. Were you always someone who followed writers or did you follow more characters? Uh, oh, as a kid, characters, definitely. I mean, there's no question. So for me, it was Superman. So my allowance um, roughly allowed me to buy six comics a month. So the comics I bought was Superman, Action Comics, DC Comics Presents, Superboy, Justice League, and then I sort of random, and that would either be the Flash, Green Lantern, something like that, you know. But that was it. That was all I could afford. Um, mm -hmm. So basically, if Superman was on the cover, I was like a publisher's dream. If Superman was on the cover, for me, that was the sign of quality. I was like, oh, I know I'm going to enjoy this, and I would pick up that issue, you know. World's Finest, that was another one I got sometimes as well. Mm -hmm. um, but then by the time you hit about maybe 13, you start to notice that a lot of the stories you really like are written by the same people, are drawn by the same people. So I would start to follow the creators. And I think, I, all, I mean, I, I was, I wanted to be an artist before I wanted to be a writer. So I've always been a huge fan of comic book art. But I think 
there was some amazing writers come on the scene about that time that I just fell in love with. Like I met Alan Moore when I was 13 at my first ever comic show. And he bought, he bought me my first issue of Swamp Thing. You know, he actually bought it for me. I had no money. And he, he, he it was 35 pence and he bought it for me. Um, and that became, you know, became a love affair with Alan Moore and mm-hmm. through Alan Moore I discovered Frank Miller and everything, you know. So I, I think I was pretty much always following writers through my teams. Mm-hmm. I think that's the process that just naturally ends up happening. I got into comics a lot later. I got into them when I was in my late teens, early 20s. And at first, I was just grabbing characters that I knew and recognized. I was like, I know who Batman is. I know who this person is. I'm going to go from there. But then the same thing happened where I started to just realize I was gravitating towards certain people and now it's the point where if i'm reading something older especially i can start to be like this is probably auto bender and then i can go and check i'm like yes i was right there's the animal transformations <laughs> <laughs> those guys can really interesting. have you read the auto bender um autobiography uh, not but it's a biography no not i have not yet i need to it's on my list because the last one i read through was there was a kurt schaffenberger one that was yeah. really interesting because i fell in love with kurt schaffenberger's art through all of the Lois Lane, like yeah. Superman's girlfriend, Lois Lane, which I feel is an incredibly underrated series that deserves more attention. <laughs> it's so funny you say this, right? Because um, I mean, I, I've got them all here, like I collected in omnibuses, but my mm. middle daughter became obsessed with them in lockdown. Now she would have been at the time eight, nine, you know, she was, mm-hmm. but, and she wasn't, she, she'd read Fantastic Four actually, she liked those and she liked some Legion and then she was uh, checking out. And then she read the story. It was Lois Lane, the fattest girl in Metropolis, or something like that. And a, and a witch makes Lois hundred pounds or something like this, you know. And she was in. She was just like, "This is the greatest thing I've ever read." <laughs> and every night we would read three Lois Lane. They actually collected them with the Jimmy Olsen stories as well. It was the Superman mm-hmm. family books. We burned through those, and we read everything. We went on the pirate sites, everything, you know. <laughs> and we read, we read every every Lois Lane comic from the fifties up until the seventies, and. and they are they're really underrated and Kurt Scheffenberger's art is amazing it's so good and like my daughter when she first started drawing she drew in a a Scheffenberger style weirdly because that was the art that influenced her so Mm -hmm. much it's because they're very expressive faces I noticed that right away like coming from the boring art which is just Wayne boring not that it is boring but just the creator (laughs) beforehand to Scheffenberger's and you can even see the transition of him copying that style to becoming more assertive in his own style And I think that's one of the cool things I like about following comics is you can track these evolutions and changes over time. And even though you have these characters and they have these kind of core structures that have become kind of the overall narrative, they still also have these very unique moments in these unique periods. Like you were saying, like Superman's completely different if you go back and read him in the Silver Age compared to now, to the point where it's sometimes he doesn't even feel like the same character. But I find that really interesting. (laughs) But it still feels like Superman, doesn't it? It's really weird because I think the DC stuff is more open to interpretation than the Marvel stuff. Like, if you write Spider-Man slightly differently, it feels wrong. Like, Spider-Man just feels very, very precise, you know, and Captain America and all these guys, you know, the Tony Stark, they feel very precise. Like, they, they've come fully formed. Where Superman, Batman in particular, I think they feel very amorphous, you know, so... If you put Spider-Man in space, it's weird. But strangely, if you put Batman in space, it's, in the 1950s, it worked absolutely fine. You would see Batman get into UFOs and everything. All the know? time, <laughs> yeah. yeah it's, it's weird, you know. But, and Superman can be stories that are gritty, set in suicide slum or something like that, you know. But at the same time, they can take place in a different dimension 10,000 years in the future, you know. So And, and, and he can look different but still feel like Superman. It's very odd. The de- I, I, I had an interpretation of this when I was a kid and I, I thought mm-hmm. that, the DC characters feel like fairy tales, you know, where they, they change over centuries. I feel they'll be around forever, you know, uh, whereas the Marvel stuff, I think, feels like a soap opera. It feels it feels much more contemporary and defined. Yeah. I just feel there's something about the core. A lot of the DC characters have this base core of their origins or how they started that's just so solid that it gives you this nice base, but it also gives you a lot of ways that you can spring off of it without Mm -hmm. going so far that it's broken or you've tipped it. It's the way that you can have a Superman story where he's 
really human and grounded and it works. But at the same time, even if not, it's not going to be everybody's cup of tea. You can do a story where he's more alien and isolated and it still makes sense because you haven't gone off of the initial core. There's just something about them that's very firmly rooted and it has been since their inception. I think it's their mythological roots. Like, I mean, I know Thor is mythological, but the Marvel characters don't feel mythological to me. They feel quite current. Whereas, you know, the Atomic Age characters really aren't. Uh, whereas DC feels like the characters feel like their stories could be thousands of years old. Like they could all be told at any time. And even even like the, the adventures themselves, like Superman fights fifth dimensional imps. He fights elves, you know. Mm-hmm. I mean, these are, these are fairy tales, aren't they? They are. And I feel like even the Golden Age stuff feels that way when it was grittier oh, and there was more of the criminal element, even though some of that has been forgotten, but it's never fully forgotten. And that's one of the exciting things is that you still see those things referenced and they still come up and they still matter. And that's yeah. one of the things I enjoy about comics is that legacy and the longevity. And it's just, there's something so unique about it that you don't see in other forms of entertainment so much. Yeah. Yeah. That's what's interesting about James Gunn's Superman. Because I think for the first time ever, we're going to see somebody lean into that aspect of these characters, like the the craziness that you don't see in, in anything outside of comics, like the idea of, of a dog wearing a cape. Yeah. You know, you know, I think James is going to do some really some crazy stuff here, you know, which and it's going to be so interesting to see how people respond to it because I think 20 years ago you couldn't have done it, but I think the audience is so accepting of superheroes now and superhero concepts that I think... If we can have Rocket Raccoon, we can have Crypto. You know? like no, and are- it's exciting because then you get to see characters you don't normally see. I didn't ever think I'd see Mr. Terrific. So I'm like, oh my goodness, it's Mr. Terrific in his coat looking like that. That's not something I thought I would see, <laughs> but it's exciting. I love it. I love it. I love that we're in this this period. I know that the superhero bubble has slightly burst in Hollywood, but, like, um, but I love the fact that everybody's so superhero literate. The fact that if I'd said to somebody, uh, as I did, if I said to somebody in the 90s, I was working on a superhero comic, you could actually see their eyes glaze over. Like, oh, no. my normal friends, like, no, no, I might as well be saying I'm doing the Lone Ranger or something, just <laughs> no interest at all. Whereas now when you say, I mean, I, I travel a lot and whenever I go through security, especially when I was working at Marvel, they would say, what are you doing in New York um, at the customs desk? And I'd say, oh, I work at Marvel, I'm going up for a meeting. And the guy's eyes would light up, you know, it, they, they would... They, they became a kid again when they heard you work for Marvel, you know? So there, there was something, something great has happened in the last 25 years. It's, it's such a cool time to be doing this. What do you find is like the best part about writing comics right now? Is it that fact that it's just, there's so much more acceptance? Do you feel that nerd culture overall has shifted towards being a bit more culturally acceptable? Um, Yeah, I think that comes with its downside too, actually. It's funny you say that because... I think what made comics so interesting previously is its radicalism and the fact that it was kind of the frowned upon thing. You know, it wasn't the um, it wasn't something your teachers or your parents especially wanted to be reading. And there's a there's a fantastic pirate element to it um, that there always has been. It's comics is it's so unpoliced. It's essentially just a weirdo like me, you know, with a piece of paper and a pen, and they go and make up a story, you know. And, and I, I love that aspect of it. But when it gets too corporate, when it gets too big, when 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 it's uh, regarded as, you know, a great American medium and everything, it can become a little self-important. I remember somebody had a, I can't remember who it was, somebody released this ad campaign for comics a few years ago, and they called it Literature Side Hustle. And I remember mm-hmm. comic guys were going crazy, saying, how dare you describe our medium as a side hustle? And I loved that, actually, because I actually <laughs> thought, it's pretty cool to, to you know, you, you don't want to be that thing that, that that's approved by everyone. You know, I think the underground aspect of comics is its most exciting part, you know. So um, so, so for me, what I love about comics right now is that you, you can do anything. But I think mm-hmm. we should take full advantage of that as well. Like, we've, like something like Saga, I think, is the perfect comic. I love the fact that 10 years ago now, 11 years ago, when they brought that book out, there was nothing like it. The, the, mm-hmm. no point of reference for saga in any way whatsoever if you try to recommend it to someone you know <laughs> but it's something straight out of brian and fiona's heads and uh and there was a market for it it sold more than most marvel and dc books 
and in trade form, it sold way more than Marvel and DC books. Um, I love that, you know, it's, uh, we, we need to see more of that, more radicalism, I think. I find it very fascinating, the idea of the double-edged sword aspect, because I see that in fandom a bit as well. Like, on the one hand, it's great that everything's so open and there's so much discussion. But on the other hand, there is that kind of comfort in when you know that you're in, a, like, a fandom space and it's just people who, who get it. Because I feel that way about comics a lot. Like, there are just some people who get it. You know, yeah. some people who get it and love it. And then for others, it's a bit weird. But like you said, I think that is some of the fun aspect of it, that it is a bit strange and a bit weird and that you can go and tell really outlandish stories. I feel like that's part of what it's for. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You know, and I think when, when something's just, um, when something's looked down on, it's kind of slightly cooler, I think, you know, and there was a phenomenon in Hollywood. Um, my, one of my friends, Damon Lindelof, the guy who created Lost, he had a, a name called a ferd. Have you ever heard of a ferd? Mm -mm. A ferd is a fake nerd, right? And what it is is it's a guy who wants in on nerds because nerd culture is currently hot, right? And this was a thing mm -hmm. he talked about 15 years ago. So all these guys who'd never read a comic would always come in and pitch for comic book movies and everything, pretending they were comic book fans, you know? And he came, he came up with this great name for these guys, which was ferds. And, uh, and there was a lot of ferds around, you know, like you, and you, you would always hear them get something slightly wrong. You know, they would just get a word slightly wrong or they would get somebody's secret identity slightly wrong. And then the other guys at the table are like, mm, this guy's a ferd. So he's not <laughs> but I, I think, um, but I think that's disappearing a little bit as well. You know, I think like that's a period when superheroes in particular were white hot, you know, from s summer 2000 with the X-Men movie up until about probably Avengers Endgame in 2019. All the ferds were everywhere, you know, trying to get in on this. But now I think it's starting to go back again a little bit to just the people who absolutely love it again, you know, which which I think is quite good. I kind of like it. It should be slightly embarrassing reading a comic on the train again. <laughs> <laughs> have you ever read comics in public or have you kept it on the down low? <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what's funny? Um, as a teenager, I used to be really embarrassed. Like, I remember... I remember hiding when I was um, on the train one time, I was hiding my comics in amongst other stuff. Mm -hmm. And I was standing on a busy train and I dropped what I was carrying and my comics scattered all over the floor. And it felt like I was smuggling pornography or something like that. <laughs> oh my God, this is so humiliating. And I remember picking them all up and moving up the train and sitting somewhere else. Where now I wouldn't care. I mean, one of the beauties of, one of the beauties of being middle-aged is you actually don't care about anything. You know, what, <laughs> Once you're a dad, you know you're embarrassing. That's part of the job. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's true. I'm just waiting for the inevitable moment when I'm told that I'm embarrassing. I'm I'm not there yet. I'm still cool. I'm like, so let me enjoy it while the coolness is lasting. Because I'm sure all of the things, like the channel, all the comics, at some point, it's just going to become incredibly cringe for my children. <laughs> <laughs> but then they'll come through the other side of it and it'll be really cool when they're a bit older again, you know? So I've, I've got that, like my children range from, you know, adults down to a 10 year old, you know, so I've got mm -hmm. a 26 year old, I've got a 12 year old and a 10 year old. And, um, and it's funny because my 12 year old who thought everything I said was amazing until about a month ago or something like that, you know, <laughs> like, and, and everything I said, she was like, that, that, that's a hundred percent correct, you know, and, and now she's, you know, pushing back a little, she's got her own personality and her own opinions. And, uh, but my 26 year old, by the time she was about maybe 18, she was like, hang on, dad, right? You know, and, and kind of <laughs> again a little bit. So you have, a, you have about six years where your, your dad's an idiot and then. Uh, <laughs> again, <you know. laughs> What's it like seeing your children interact with your own work? Well, I have to be careful which ones I let them see, you know, so like, uh, you know, the, the one that really works, I don't know if you've read it, it's a book I did with Stuart Eminem called Empress, which is about there, I think. Hang on. Here. <laughs> there it is, there it is. Um, on my shelf. And um, I did that about maybe seven or eight years ago. And um, it's actually just a nice family-friendly space opera type thing. And my middle daughter, uh, when she was about 10, she saw it on the shelves. And she was reading Lois Lane at the time and everything. And she said, can I read this? And it was the first of my books that I let her read. And luckily there was nothing upsetting or scary or anything in it. And she absolutely loved it. And then she started picking up my other books. And I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Never come, <laughs> in, never come in unless I'm in here too, you know. So I gave her Chrononauts next and everything, you know. And there was a little bit of swearing in Chrononauts. You know, there was a few curses and everything. 
And she said to me, oh, that's not very nice. You know, like, I, I'm, I'm, I don't like this. And I said, it's actually the man who draws it, Sean Gordon Murphy. He, he put the swearing in, you know, so I, I just put <laughs> Sean instead. You know? <laughs> but I just think that that's such a fun part of the process. It must be extra nice for you because they're your own creations and... Have you seen that impact with your eldest? Have you seen some of your work impact her work in terms of what she's creating? <clears throat> no, no, she's, it's so fascinating. I remember when she was about four in 2002, she and I were sitting drawing in the living room and the TV was on and um, she was watching Cartoon Network. And I looked at her artwork and I looked at my artwork and my artwork looked kind of like Kurt Swan. You know, that's kind of, Kurt Swan, Gil Kane, you know, those are sort of my influences. And I looked at her artwork and it looked like Dragon Ball Z. Mm -hmm. and, and I was like, oh my God. And I had this realization that, you know, she will be different from me, you know, in the same way that I was different from my dad. Like my dad would watch stuff I would never dream of watching, you know, on TV and everything. And he was into things that were just his generation's things. Um, and I realized that she was going to be into stuff that I didn't connect with in the same way because my childhood was Hannah Barbera and Marvel Comics and DC. Her childhood was going to be Cartoon Network and Japanese style art. Mm -hmm. So when she was drawing characters, they looked Japanese. And I knew that when she grew up and if she if she was an artist or, or, or did comics, it would be something I couldn't get my head around because we grew up in different times. So it's funny, I do, as her dad, I do try and give her advice. And, she, and she's very nice about it. She, <laughs> Emily will always say to me, it's okay, dad, I've got this. You know? and, and, and I realized it would be like my dad trying to tell me how to write kick ass. You know, like you, you just, you have to trust that your children know what they're doing. It'll, it'll be okay. And mm -hmm. she's amazing. I'm, I'm her absolute biggest fan. Like I love that she brought out last month, she brought out her first two graphic novels and not just one, but she launched two in the same day. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, I, I talk to, I, I show them to everyone. I couldn't be more proud. I love that she's doing what I do. Mm -hmm. Do you find, like, do you hear a lot in the space about, you know, about children? And of course, there's the importance of bringing in, like, new generations into a medium to help it keep growing and survive. Do you think that there is a bit of a disconnect between how old some of the comics are pitched now in yeah. terms of getting some of those younger kids into it? A hundred percent. But what's really interesting is whenever companies have tried to do this in the past, when they try and do stuff aimed at a younger audience, like Superman Adventures, when I was working there, Batman Adventures prior to that, some really amazing comics. I think the, the, the youth orientated ones actually quite often were better than the, the regular monthlies. I think that the Batman animated comic in particular was so good, you know, and Scott McCloud did a great job in um, the, the Superman one. But the Batman one was amazing. Uh, I, I remember it was Ty Templeton was doing it at the time and Rick Burchett and everybody, the, the, the teams they had were phenomenal. But the people who were buying it were like 40 year old men. Mm -hmm. It was it was really weird. It actually was the opposite of what you would think. It actually skewed slightly older because what it did was it excited people who had maybe drifted away from these characters but remembered them being a little more simplistic and it's a bit more like their childhood version of it. So strangely, the, the average reader was maybe 30, but the average reader of the animated stuff was about 40. So the letters mm -hmm. we used to get tended to be from adults and not children. So, so I, I don't know what the answer is because... Every time they try and skew something young, it tends to lure in the older audience. But books like Dogman and, you know, and all these things that my, my Bunny versus Monkey and all these books that my 10-year-old daughter's obsessed with, um, they're doing something that the Marvel and DC books just aren't. And I, I don't know what it is. It's some magic. The fact that the most recent uh, Dogman, I think the first printing was 5 million copies, mm -hmm. is mind-blowing. It's absolutely amazing. But all power to them. I just, I wish I could figure that out, what that would be in Marvel and DC terms. Yeah, I don't know, but there's some magic there. I know everything about Dogman because it's just every issue, we need to be there right away <laughs> to get on the Dogman train. Oh, my, my, my daughter would cut your throat for an issue. For a <laughs> she really would. She absolutely loves it. No, it's interesting because I think the interest is there though, because I see it with, yeah. with my daughter. Like she loves those characters like Batman, Superman. She's so into them. It's yeah. just finding the things that are appropriate or that I feel are appropriate. I know that she comes in here sometimes and probably finds things that aren't appropriate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's true because um, I, I think you should always have a blank piece of paper when you're working in any business, you know, and, just because something's 
excuse me, I got COVID last week when I was in Corfu. Um, just because something's done um, one way doesn't mean it should always be done this particular way. So, so I, the actual shape of a Dogman book is what my youngest considers a comic to look like. Mm. They consider them to be about 120, 140 pages and that format, that size. So I don't know. I mean, maybe one of the answers is to try and do something aimed at that market that can be stacked alongside Dogman. Maybe you do younger Superman and Batman stories and so on, but in that format and see how it goes. I don't know. I mean, hopefully somebody smarter than me comes up with something because I think you're right. I think the kids adore these characters, but for some reason they're going for Dogman instead of Batman. Mm-hmm. <coughs> it's gonna be it's gonna be interesting to see the way things evolve like i feel like in terms of comics i think it's something that i'm just always going to love like i'm not sure why it's one of those things where i know some people peel off and some people stay with it but i think it's a i think it's a lifelong love affair so <laughs> see, what, i i've never asked you this because i'm so curious because you said you commence it in your late teens mm-hmm. now most people i know who get into comics in their late teens they're rekindling a love they had for comics when they were five or six years old. But you sound like you just started reading when you were in your late teens. Did you never read them growing up as a, as a kid? No, there was like a, there were a couple that I remember lying around because I know my dad read some. And so there are a couple that I remember flipping through when yeah. I was a kid, but nothing in like nothing that I would actually go and like read them concretely. I didn't know how to get them or really firmly what they were. But it's just when I was waiting around at a bus stop for university and there was a bookstore there. And so I was always in there just walking around and they had that huge graphic novel section. And I saw it was Batman Hush and I saw the cover and I was just like, I'm, I was always looking at it. I was always looking at yeah. the art and I was like, you know, I know who most of these characters are. I have right. the time. Like, why yeah. not? Let me just pick it up. And then I read it on the bus and that was just the start of it. <laughs> That's amazing. So Batman Hush was your first comic. Yeah, like the first like official one, like the first one that I remember reading because the memories unlocked the more I did this yeah. channel was Catwoman yeah. 13 from the 1990s was yeah. one that I do remember reading. I remember I read it till it fell apart. And then there was a Witchblade issue, but I have no idea which Witchblade it was. But <laughs> <laughs> It's funny, isn't it? Because a lot of people say, oh, you have to make comics really accessible for new readers. But everybody's first comic is just some random thing like Catwoman 13 or something. And <laughs> you have no idea what's going on, but you know you're having a good time. You know, you know you're enjoying it. You know? Yeah, like there was just something interesting about it. I was like, I like this. And like looking back at it now, I'm yeah. like, there's no reason why this should have happened. Like there's no reason. <laughs> <laughs> Batman Hush, that's interesting. So that was what, 2001, 2002 or something right about then? Yeah, yeah but I read it later because that oh, was the collection. Because yeah. I started reading like during the big big trade boom where it was just like everything that can be a trade is a trade which was definitely one of my favorite eras and some of my favorite trades come from there because that's when they were doing like collections of oh it's random jimmy transformations or those kind of things and i appreciate those i always say if they're gonna do a lois lane omnibus there's one guaranteed sale it's right here But I, all my favorite stuff is getting collected now as well. You know, the Jerry Conway Justice League. Did you, I'm not sure if you've covered this in the channel. Did you ever cover the Jerry Justice Leagues? No, the I Je- haven't. Oh, my God. Have you read those? No, I don't think I have. It's li- Jerry Conway um, and Carrie Bates were my two absolute favorite writers growing up. You've read a lot of Carrie Bates Superman, I think, haven't you? You've I have, yeah. And I did, like, all the Supergirl stuff as well and all of that. Yeah. Because Kat, you know, did you ever see the interview I did with Carrie on my channel? Mm-hmm. On my yeah. YouTube? He's the most fascinating guy. The fact there's only three photographs in existence of him, you know, and he's so enigmatic, you know, like no, mm-hmm. nobody, nobody's seen him in 30 years and everything. He's such an interesting guy. Um, but Carrie Bates is Superman I adore. I mean, that's, if I had to say my favorite comics of all time, it's his couple of decades on Superman. But um, Jerry Conway's run at DC, I really recommend checking out. And you should cover them on your channel because I think you'd really enjoy them. He did a couple of years with um, George Perez mm-hmm. on just Runs from about number 188 to about 209 or something like that. Absolutely. I mean, some of the greatest DC comics of all time. Absolutely amazing. You'll love them. No, it's definitely something to check out because I can feel myself skewing back into that era because I find I go through waves on the channel of like just where my interest is. And so since yeah. it's been a like currently a very modern wave, I'm like, I can already feel myself like going back. Like I'm currently reading a bunch of Silver Age like action comics. So I'm like, it's gonna end up back there. 
<laughs> what ones have you been reading? Uh, right now I'm working my way through Action Comics 259 because I'm going through a bunch of old Red Kryptonite stories when Red Kryptonite could just do absolutely anything. I was going to compile them all together like I did with Jimmy, but then I just had too much to say about this one <laughs> issue, so it's probably just going to become its own thing. <laughs> <laughs> I love Red Kryptonite stories and what I love about those things is the, the stories can be about anything you know it's like Superman's mm -hmm. already great to write stories for because he can travel through time he can go to other planets there's a million things you can do with Superman but then you throw in things like Mr. Mixes Pitalik where reality mm -hmm. can be warped you know and then Red Kryptonite stories where it affects him in a different way every time he uses it I mean the stories can literally be about anything it's they're so fun now, this is a great one where it's like he meets his younger self and it's just the funniest thing because he hates himself so much. And it's, I'm reading it from a modern perspective of like the <laughs> Paragon Superman. It's really entertaining. <laughs> <laughs> what was it that drew you to Superman? Because you hear a lot with people like, oh, Superman's boring. So like, what was it that drew you to him right away? Oh, I think for me, it's so simple. Like whenever you're a little boy, one of the things that really appeals to you is whoever is the best at something, right? So, like, little boys really love the best sportsman, you know, the best, the guy, who, the best racing driver or whatever. That's the guy you have the poster up in the wall. You don't have the the number five racing driver, you know, and, and you don't have the seventh best footballer. You have the posters you have up, the people who inspire you are the most heroic, the ones who are best at everything. And for me, Superman was just that, you know. So when I was at school, I was very lucky. I was in one of those periods when I was at uh, primary school, what you guys would maybe call uh, junior school. Like, um, everybody until about the age of 11 was into superheroes. So uh, one of my friends was really into The Flash, and I was like, why would you like The Flash? Superman's faster than The Flash, you know? <laughs> and somebody liked Batman, and I was like, Superman could kill Batman, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, like, and, you know, he could any, anything anyone else could do, Superman could do it slightly better. So he was just my guy, you know? And then as I got a little older, I really appreciated the fact that the stories had the most tremendous scope. Like, Batman has to be swinging past a mugging, you know, for something to, to happen. It's, there has to be the incredible luck that Batman is swinging past when something bad is happening in Gotham City. Whereas Superman, the world's your oyster. It can be about anything. So you never knew what the hell you were getting, especially Silver Age type stuff where, is he going to have a giant insect head? <laughs> you know, what the hell is going to be uh, in this issue? It's funny because I was on the boring train initially, but that's because I didn't know enough about him. I actually got into him through the TV series Smallville, which oh. was totally a soap opera about like just his struggles and like teen stuff. But that it clicked. I was like, oh, like Superman is Clark Kent and Clark Kent is really interesting. He has all of these like struggles and balance of the things of how can, how far can he go and all of that. And from there, it just got super interesting. And that's always the lens that stays with me, even when I'm looking at it in the past. Well, pre-crisis Superman, I think with that Clark Kent relationship is even more interesting to me because they marvelized him slightly in 1986 where he was Clark Kent first and Superman was just what he did. You know, mm -hmm. like every other superhero especially the marvel heroes um but the pre-crisis version of superman was so interesting to me because superman is who he really is mm -hmm. and he disguises himself as mild-mannered reporter clark kent so he doesn't need glasses to read he's just trying to not look like superman you know mm -hmm. so he puts on a suit and he, he works in the newspaper so he can have access to emergencies that's happening around around the city or around the world and there's something beautiful about that elliot magan wrote a really brilliant book called um, Superman, uh, Last Son of Krypton, which mm -hmm. covers it really brilliantly. And Alan Moore uh, touched on a lot of this stuff too, where what they said was Clark Kent was a work of art that Superman created. And there's no other superhero ever done this, you know? And, and that's what makes it so interesting to me that Clark Kent has his own favorite television programs. He probably likes country music. He'll wear double denim, you know? It's like Clark, Clark Kent is just an invention of Superman. And he's such a perfect three-dimensional construct as a piece of art that people believe he's a real person, that his colleagues think he's a real person, you know? Mm. So Superman has manufactured this fake identity where he can hang out with people because he can't really quite hang out as Superman, but he's got this lovely persona that he can just put on and just sit and chill and have a good time that he doesn't get a chance to do as Superman. And I love that aspect of it because there's no other character in comics that's like that. I find it fascinating because now in this era, like there is always that 
struggle to reconcile those two things it feels mm. like like how much do you pull from the post crisis but how much do you take from the pre and so superman's always i find being worked through in different different ways every time they relaunch him i'm like he's slightly different and that's why it's always fun to come back to him i think that's one of the things that helps keep the characters fresh that change i know that there's always that bit of push against change everybody has their favorite era that they'll always come back to but that's one of the things that makes it interesting and one of the great things about comics is that you can always go back to those eras that are your favorites they still exist i mean they're still there yeah and and i think everybody's favorite anything is the one they saw first you know so my favorite james bond was roger moore because that's the first one i saw my favorite doctor who i guess was tom baker you know mm -hmm. the first one I was a kid and likewise superman for me is christopher reeve because i was eight years old when christopher reeve appeared on the big screen so so for me you know my idea of superman was absolutely locked on that and every mm -hmm. other one that comes since feels like a variation on the real deal and the real deal for me is the 70s superman no i feel that way like for me batman is the animated series batman because that's it's like the, the first <laughs> I totally agree one of my friends is up for the part of batman um, and the new movie that's getting made mm -hmm. at that point. And uh, he said to me, what do, you, what, what do you think's the best? What comic? And I said, I think the Denny O'Neill, Neil Adams run. The Frank Miller stuff is amazing, right? But mm -hmm. it's been used in so many movies. You can't go back to doing Frank Miller because everybody's done Frank Miller for the last 20 years, you know, <clears throat> in cinematic terms. And I said, Denny O'Neill, Neil Adams, Steve Englehart, Marshall Rogers, look at those. But especially look at the Batman animated series, especially the first couple of seasons. I mean, that was perfection. It was just the perfect tone for Batman because it was dark enough that adults took it seriously, but light enough that kids still wanted the toys and wanted to be Batman. Mm -hmm. I think that's the perfect tone for Batman. My my issue with the modern Batman films is no kids want to see them. They're, it's actually a little creepy looking, you know? Um, mm -hmm. it's like a guy you want to be. Whereas the Batman animated series, if I was a kid, I'd have been losing my mind for that. I'd want every toy. No, for sure. Like they're definitely, I, you can always tell you've lost a kid if they leave the room. Yeah. <laughs> like if you're watching something and they leave, it's just like, oh, it's over. So <laughs> 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 we just have to do something else now. <laughs> well, I, I found that with Star Wars, you know, like no, nobody under 45 cares about Star Wars, you know? And like, uh, I remember trying to get my kids into it. And they were, I, I didn't realize they were just being polite. They were like, oh, no, <laughs> we're really into this, you know? And then I saw one of them on their phone. They were, I looked around to see how much they were loving it and they were on their phone. And I was like, okay, I'm not, not going to force this on you. <laughs> I had that moment with Star Trek because I just adore Star Trek. And yeah. my daughter was trying to stay up late and she was like, we can even watch Star Trek. I'm like, oh, even. <laughs> 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 that's hilarious <laughs> do you know what's funny i loved star trek as a kid and then i didn't think about it for a long time and last year a couple of friends and i really got back into star trek again right and we mm -hmm. so I, I i'm talking i hadn't watched it since i was like 10 you know mm -hmm. and we, we re-watched all the star trek movies and and one a week every wednesday night mm -hmm. they would come around to my house and we started with star trek the motion picture and we went all the way up to number six and it's so damn good. Like that's those that's movies. That's amazing. <laughs> I mean, I know this is the most obvious thing to say, but like I checked out a Star Trek when I was 10, you know, but I really love it again. And I, and I was amazed at the consistency in those movies, like how well made those films mm -hmm. are. Like, I mean, obviously two and three are beloved. They're really regarded. Mm -hmm. I think they're all good. And I think one's a masterpiece. The motion picture's actually a masterpiece, I think. I find that one gets maligned. I'm like, you need to get into the headspace for one. They're trying yeah. different things out with it than what they do with the rest of them. But it's still really good on its own merits. It's just incredibly different from the rest of them. It's really grown up. It's a really grown up film. And, and I remember um, I went to see Star Wars when I was seven. And then I couldn't wait for the Star Trek movie coming out when I was nine. Mm -hmm. I thought it was going to be all blasting aliens and everything just like Star Wars, you know? And it wasn't. It was more like 2001 A Space Odyssey, you know? Mm -hmm. But as an adult, I really appreciate it. It's cool stuff. I think my favorite one uh, was Six. And I think it still is, like, of the original ones. Like, even as a kid, I always liked Six a lot. And, like, the more that I got older, I'm like, there's so many layers in Six. <laughs> <laughs> I like this lot going on, too. But, like, Six. <laughs> well, those last two movies, I don't know if they've run out of money a little bit. You know, like... 
But I think that idea of Spock's renegade half-brother is such a mm. great concept, isn't it? The idea that Spock's got a dangerous half-brother is such a cool idea, I think. I liked it because I know people like to make fun of Five and like, why does God need a starship and stuff? But I'm like, there are lots of really interesting ideas yeah. inside of it, especially when you're playing with pushing back against the Vulcan ideology, which is something yeah. that is very revered inside the Star Trek universe. I'm like, that's an interesting idea, the concept of people rejecting it or going in a different direction. I'm like, that's fun to explore. Like, I know some of it's cheesy, but there is a lot of good stuff in there. I think it was very um, in tune with the, the original series as well. I think it felt like a great episode of the TV show, you know, number mm-hmm. five. No, like it's it's fun. It's fun to be able to come back and explore all of these things. Like we were talking earlier, it's just, it is a privilege to be in this time when there is the ability to access so much and be able to come together and talk about it. Absolutely. I mean, as somebody who grew up in the 80s, you know, like I say, when... Hardly anybody was into this stuff. Hardly any movies were coming out like this. Virtually no television shows were coming out like this. You know, like, I mean, we're in a golden age. We're in an absolute golden age. No, we are. And speaking of which, it's been great that we get the chance to connect and talk. But I think on my end, at least sadly, I have run out of time because I can hear people returning in the background. (laughs) I'll need to go and get my dinner as well. That's uh, go to seven fifteen actually. So uh, we're, we're going to do a movie tonight. My my youngest kid is really into dragons right now. So we're oh, watching okay. every night. We're watching a dragon based movie. Oh nice! <laughs> I don't I don't know what tonight's dragon based movie is, but that's that's what I'm off to. I'm going to grab some dinner and then watch this film with the kids. You know. No, well, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me. <laughs> Not at all. I've actually really enjoyed it. You, whenever you have a new book out, or as we have five new books out. Um, the pimping is actually a really fun part because you get to have these kind of chats and it goes in directions you don't expect, which I love as well, you know, so, you know, we talk nemesis and everything, you know, but the fun stuff, is, I didn't know you were so into Star Trek, you know, so I've learned something. As well. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. I really appreciate it. I'm sure people will be really excited to check out all of the fun stuff coming out of Miller World. <laughs> I hope so. And listen, thanks again for taking the time. Thanks for having me. No, thank you. <laughs> all the best then. Thanks so much, everyone who made it to the end. Thanks to Mark Miller for taking some time out to talk comics with us. Please check out some of the upcoming additions to Miller World. Nemesis Rogues Gallery, Issue 1, coming July 24th, 2024. Prodigy, Slaves of Mars, Issue 1, coming August 7th, 2024. And Nightclub 2, Issue Number 1, coming August 21st, 2024. And of course, also check out Mark's YouTube channel, Miller Time. He does a bunch of really interesting interviews with an eclectic bunch of creators. As always, thanks so much for taking some time out of your day to spend discussing comics with me. I always appreciate it and I will see you again soon. Bye-bye.